I've been asked to talk about the moon. So I'm going to talk about the moon and um, I'm just going to do it at a sort of like a, a, a miscellaneous selection of things, really, which I hope will be of interest to, to everyone. And um, so it's called Exploring a Moon. I've just put this talk together. I have some moon rocks with me and I have some other things to do with the moon with me. And then um, we'll see how we get on showing those of the camera with this virtual background as well as, as time goes on. So um, let's, uh, let's explore the moon from the Earth, from space, and also from the moon's surface itself. So what I'm going to do is basically um, give a beginner's talk to the moon and also a bit, people with a bit more knowledge um, will get something out of this. Um, what, what we've known about the moon through time and what we kind of can, can do currently, both as amateurs and as professional explorers. So um, I won't do a list of titles, but there's a nice picture of um, our home, the Earth. Can you see that? That little dot in the sky. Um, this is taken by the Japanese Kadua, Kadua spacecraft uh, going over one of the lunar poles. That might be the South Pole, it might be the North Pole, I'm not quite sure. So the moon is a long way from the Earth. It's a very mysterious body and it's also part of the it's basic companion to the Earth. So the moon was just a bright thing in the sky for thousands of years and then shortly after the telescope was um, invented around about 1608 um, a couple of gentlemen Galileo being one um, turned their telescopes towards the sky and Galileo had a very small telescope probably about a magnification of times six for the early ones and maybe up to times 20 for later ones and he basically wanted to know what was the moon he wasn't interested in mapping it, he wanted to kind of work out what it was. And his field of view was so small that he used to have to scan across the moon with his telescope and build up a drawing. And that's why some of these drawings, like that what he published in um, 1610, look, look, slightly, look slightly out of proportion because he's actually built them up. So here are two Galileo sketches. You can see the seas here. This is the lit half of the moon. This is the night side of the moon rather large crater here, probably slightly larger than reality. And then two weeks later, we have the other side of the moon lit by the sun. Here's the night side. And you can see a lot more of the lava seas on the, on the moon on that image. So they're not too bad, those sketches, considering the telescope that he had. Uh, a lot of people think Galileo was the first person to draw the moon. And um, that's essentially true, although the English contemporary Thomas Harriot did do one sketch of the moon, a very basic sketch, a few months before Galileo did. And this is that first sketch of the moon in um, the late summer of 1609. And that's all, all you can see on it. It doesn't really look much like the moon. You can see the crescent shape. This is the terminator here. And some hints of the seas, probably the Sea of Crisis, Sea of Tranquility. So that was the only sketch of the moon that existed before Galileo did some detailed sketches with a better telescope. But Thomas Harriot continued, he wasn't really trying to work out what the moon was. Um, he basically wanted to map it. And about three years after he did this sketch, yeah. this is where my computer decides to freeze, mm -hmm. he produced this map of the moon. So this is the first map of the moon and it's actually quite recognizable, isn't it? Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. You see the dark and light shows quite well with Thomas Harriot's map. Go, go back to Galileo. Galileo wasn't so much wanting to map the moon, but he was trying to work out what the craters were, what, where the mountains and how high the mountains were. And he was basically trying to consider it as a world and measure the heights of the mountains using shadows. And he got the right answers. So he was basically exploring what the moon was, where Thomas Harriot was basically mapping the moon with the very first sketch and then better sketches later on. So jumping on from sketches, when photography came along in the uh, 19th century, a few people pointed their cameras at the moon. I don't know some people here have done that on occasion. And this is, um, in fact, the first person to photograph the moon, I think it was a French um, sort of pioneer in, in photography. His lab unfortunately burned down and the images were lost. So we don't have the first photograph of the moon, but the first surviving picture of the moon is this one, um, just over half lit, taken in um, 1851. You can see, here's a sea of tranquility here, and there's a sea of crises, and it's not, well, 
a bit overexposed, maybe. Probably not the best picture of the moon we, we've seen. But that's the early surviving picture of the moon. So as well as drawing, we can now get photographs to try and map out the features on the moon's surface. And very rapidly, photographic methods got a lot better. And uh, this English lad, well, he was English-American, but he was born in Lancashire, John William Draper. He was basically a chemist and he, he took this picture of the moon. And he took this picture of the moon after he moved to America. So this was the first astro image taken on the American continent. So a nice full moon. And that's, that's not too bad an attempt for the um, man about 1840, is it? Mm. So you can see the um, two types of land on the moon quite well. The, the light areas, the dark areas, and that's a fundamental thing about the moon. So one of the things we can see in these pictures are the craters. They're not quite big enough to see with your own eyes, although you can see the ejector around Tycho and Copernicus at full moon. I, I can just about see those. But the craters are just too small to see with our eyes. But on the, with a telescope and a camera, they, they're quite obvious on these craters. Not so obvious at full moon. So craters was a term coined by Galileo, and it basically circular things all over the moon's surface. What are they? And on the Earth, craters are usually linked to volcanoes. So it seemed quite reasonable to think that the craters on the moon were due to volcanoes. So one idea is that the moon erupts and dust comes out of the moon. You see my cursor, okay? Yeah. Rocks and dust and things, ash comes out of the moon and blankets either side and formed a nice volcanic crater. So does the moon have volcanoes forming its craters? Mm -hmm. And the alternative theory at the time was that the craters are due to meteorite impacts. So a piece of rock from space hits the moon at high speed and blasts out a big hole in the ground. And this, this um, argument about what formed the craters lasted, um, well, probably about a century or so. It was still raging in the 1950s and early 1960s because the volcanic people think, well, most of the craters are circular and volcanoes erupt circular craters unless the wind blows the ash in one direction, then you start to get elongated ones. But if the moon has almost no atmosphere, it doesn't have any wind, so the volcanoes would make circular craters. Whereas they argued that meteorites will hit the moon from any direction and therefore the holes in the ground should be all signs of shapes, lots of ellipses. So that was the argument for the volcanoes. But the meteorite impacts turns out to be the correct mm. theory because it doesn't matter what the angle that a rock hits the moon's surface is. For most <coughs> angles of hitting the moon's surface, the shock wave that carves out the crater is a hemispherical shock wave going through the rock. So no matter what the in, in angle is to start with, the final crater is always circular. And that only starts to not apply when they got very glancing blows, almost horizontal sort of impacts. So most angles where something hits the moon's surface, you end up with a circular crater because it's shock waves that dig out the crater. So we now know that almost all the craters on the moon are due to meteorite impacts, but there are a few craters which are due to volcanoes. There are volcanoes on the moon, but very few of the craters are volcanic. You'll see one later on. So another question raising in the 19th century is where did the moon come from? So there were three basic ideas that scientists thought were reasonable before the um, space age. And that was basically perhaps the moon was part of the earth and the earth was spinning really fast long ago, fastly rotating earth and a big blob of it spun off into space and formed the moon. And the person who came up with this idea was actually George Darwin, son of Charles Darwin. And his theory was that the hole left behind was the Pacific Ocean. And the Pacific Ocean might seem plausible, but to volume wise, the Pacific Ocean is nothing like the volume of the moon. So that doesn't really make much sense. This theory would predict that the Earth and Moon have the same composition. Okay, so a bit wild, but it's a theory. Another theory is that the moon basically formed somewhere else in the solar system and managed to get captured around the Earth. And this is quite unlikely because something approaching the Earth, the Earth's gravity will accelerate it and it will either hit the Earth in more probability or swing by and go heading off into space again. Sort of um, that's what will happen. So it's very hard to go into orbit unless you find a way of slowing down. And the moon, of course, doesn't have its own rockets to slow down. 
So if an object was, like the moon was coming in, there would have to be something like a very large atmosphere around the early Earth to break the moon just enough to allow it to lose enough speed to go into orbit. And that's very unlikely. So this theory doesn't really have a lot of credence, but it does predict that the moon and the Earth have different <clears> compositions. <throat> and the third theory, handing around at the time, was that basically the Earth and the moon are siblings. They both form together from the same cloud of material. And this theory would also argue that Earth and moon have the same composition and the same minerals and elements in them. Okay, so that's, that was the science of the 19th century. So we could look at the moon through telescopes, we could sketch it, take basic photographs, and basically ponder how the craters form and where did the moon come from. So the science of the 19th century had its limitations because everyone's on the Earth, we can't go out into space, and we can't do experiments to find out which of these ideas is correct. And along comes the 20th century, the first half of which was not really any progress. We could get better pictures, like this full moon from the Lick Observatory. So basically we could look at the moon, map it, down to about a kilometre or so in size, features on the moon seen through the Earth's atmosphere. These days you can do better with image processing, uh, removing the atmospheric effects. But basically we were no wiser about what was on the other side of the moon, we didn't know. Where the moon came from, we didn't know and um, the composition, we didn't know. So we had to wait until the space age to actually go to the moon and find out about it. And um, the Russians had some early starts with the space race for the moon. They sent several probes to the moon and Luna 2 hit the moon, Luna 1 missed, Luna 2 hit it and sort of crashed. And Luna 3, this one here, went around to the other side and took some pictures. So the first view at the far side of the moon was returned by Luna 3 in 1959. And that's what the picture was. That's the best of the pictures. It looks quite different. There's um, basically, there's hardly any of these black areas. The black areas towards the bottom left are actually just on the edge of the side that faces the Earth. And all this white area is the far side of the moon, which you'd never see from the Earth. Mm. And there's just one or two very small patches here and there. This is actually the Sea of Moscow, this one here. So the, the far side of the moon looks a lot different from the side that faces the Earth. So that was a piece of information. As the space race continued, better spacecraft went to the moon, the lunar orbiters went into orbit around the moon and mapped the moon very closely to determine wh where we could land astronauts. And this is an example of a lunar orbital image. This is kind of the boundary between the near side and the far side, but the side that faces the Earth is to the right and the far side is to the left. And this, this big basin here, this big impacts feature is right on the edge of the moon seen from Earth. Most of it's on the far side. So we've got the whole surface mapped from orbit, very high resolution, no atmosphere getting in the way. <coughs> so you can get nice maps of the moon by the 1960s. This is my map, the one I recommend is the National Geographic map of the moon. <coughs> it is absolutely wonderful. It's got both sides of the moon, lots of detail where the landers are for the 20th century and lots of information around the sides. So if you wanted the moon map, this is the best one to get. And you can use it scientifically because it's actually an equal area projection as well. So I do recommend a National Geographic moon map. So we've now mapped the whole of the moon. This is what the near side looks like. This is not a single image from Earth because on full moon, you can't see any shadows and you can barely see any craters. This is made after thousands of images from the LRO satellites all stitched together. And that is what the moon looks like from the Earth. The other side of the moon, if it's going to appear, looks like that. And the easy question, spot the difference. Primary difference. Some people call the far side of the moon the dark side of the moon. But it's not dark in this image, it still gets sunlight, so there is no dark side of the moon. But if you ask me which of the sides is the darkest, I would say the Earth side is the darkest side of the moon because that's where all the lavas are. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is very bright, hardly any lavas, just see of Moscow again, one or two little patches as well, and this is the near side. So you can never see this side from the Earth, that's one mystery resolved. Another question is why the lavas facing Earth are not on the other side? 
new questions arise as we find out new information. So we've got the whole moon mapped out, and this is supposed to play, it's not going to rotate properly, I don't think. I'll skip that. So just to put some features on, the side face and the earth have had names for many centuries, if not going on to thousands of years with some of them. The seas, there's an ocean, they're named after weather, states of weather and states of mind. That's the um, origin of the names of the seas. And there's some craters here as well, Copernicus, Kepler, named after philosophers and scientists in, in most parts. And after Apollo 12 landed here, this area of the Oceanus Pro Solarum was given its own name, the Known Sea, Mare Cognitum. That was added in. The far side of the moon looks like this. Very few lavas, got the Sea of Moscow, the crater Tchaikovsky, one other sea here, and I've marked a crater here called Von Karman, which is where the Chinese have landed a couple of years ago in the first far side landing on the moon. Now it's quite dark in the bottom half of this image, and if I put this, this um, ellipse on, this is one of the biggest craters in the solar system. It's called the South Pole Aitken Basin. Some people think that's the biggest crater on the moon. Some other people, including astronaut Jack Smith, who's been to the moon, thinks there is one bigger crater on the other side of the moon. So, but this is certainly one of the biggest craters in the solar system, and there it is outlined. So, we've mapped the moon from orbit. What do we see at the surface? Well, the first probe to land on the surface and take a picture was the Russian Lunar 9. This is the picture. So transmitted to Russia, unfortunately the Jodrell Bank radio telescope intercepted the signal and decoded it and published the picture in the newspapers before the Russians did. So that caused a little, um, <laughs> little argument at the time in 1966. So jumping to people landing on the moon, the space race had the aim to land a man, that's what they said in 1960s, President Kennedy, a man on the moon, and also bring them back to Earth, that was a good idea. So there's Buzz Aldrin, famous picture taken by uh, Neil Armstrong, you can see in the, in the face place. So in the 20th century, we had um, quite a lot of landings on the moon. The red ones on this chart were where the Russian spacecraft landed, they were automatic probes because they didn't quite manage to get a person in a position where they could send a person to the moon. But they had a lot of success and the three red triangles to the far right, all of those probes actually gathered moon rock and brought them back to Earth. So they were sample return missions. The, so that's the red ones with the Russian landers. The yellow ones are uh, the American landers that were robot landers to make sure it was safe to send astronauts. So they were kind of the guinea pigs. And most of them landed near the equator because that's where the Apollos were going to land as well. So they were checking out, they were landing very close to where the Apollos were, were looking at landing sites for the astronauts. They had a spare one, which they sent to the crater Tycho, the crater Tycho as well. So those are the surveyor spacecraft. And then the landers with the astronauts are in green, and there were six successful landings, Apollo 11 landing here, and the last one, Apollo 17 landing there. So the green triangles are where the astronauts landed, so the six of those sites. So that's all the landings in the 20th century. Then we didn't go to the moon for a few decades, really. And in the 21st century, we've had some more landings, this time only by China, and that's the blue triangles. But China landed um, a land run rover here and they did a sample return mission from here. So that's the two Chinese landings on the near side of the moon and as another first on the far side of the moon, China has also landed on the far side down here as well, in the middle of that big crater, one of the biggest ones in the solar system. So here's the Apollo 11 landing site. I'll just talk about the Apollos for um, a few minutes. They're quite fascinating. This is um, Buzz Aldrin, there, sort of fiddling about some equipment. Landed in 20 July 1969. Very flat level plane, just lava, just basalt, same as that dark rock I showed you before. And Neil Armstrong um, 
basically took the pictures, but he basically did an unauthorised run off to this crater here. See this big crater here? That, they weren't supposed to go to this, but Neil sort of ran over here, took some pictures and ran back again. And after the mission ended, they had to sort of work out what part of the ground they disturbed. So here's a picture of a football field. And in yellow is the, where the astronauts disturbed. There's a lander, there's a camera, this is where their footprints disturbed the ground. And Neil recollects running up here, taking some pictures from that crater and running back on a parallel, nearly parallel route. That's his recollection. Now we have spacecraft orbits in the moon, which can photograph all these things on the moon. And when you look at the Apollo 11 landing site from the LRO spacecraft, which can see things down to about 30 centimetres across, here's the lander of Apollo 11. And these, these dark tracks are the footprints of the astronauts. And you can see that Neil ran to the crater, which is here, and he basically retraced his steps with a tiny diversion. He pretty much retraced his steps. So it wasn't quite as he recollected it post-mission. It was actually more like that, more like a straight line. So you can see the footprints of the astronauts on the moon, along with cameras and other things as well. It's quite incredible. Apollo 17, the last lunar mission to land on the moon and the first one to carry a scientist, a geologist called Jack Smith. And they landed in a very spectacular terrain, this valley. It's basically it's lava coming through here. It's flat lava coming from the Sea of Serenity, which is in the background between this mountain, the South Massif, and this mountain, the North Massif. And this is about five miles or eight kilometers wide, this valley. There's the lunar module in orbit about to make its descent and it's going to land about there. So a spectacular picture, that was taken from the command module. The modern satellite, the same landing site is here. So um, there's the South Massif, the North Massif and the valley full of lava. And interesting things, this is where they landed. They had a lunar rover as well. They found some orange soil at a volcano. See the black spot there? That is a volcano. This white area here is a landslide that has fallen off this mountain. Once thought to possibly be due to a ray from the crater Tycho, and when they've picked up rocks from here and dated them, we thought we would know the age of Tycho. But it turns out that's not the case because the astronaut who did that, Jack Smith, has got second thoughts on that. Because can you see this little hill here? That's the fault where you get moonquakes and moonquakes from that probably dislodged all these landslides. That's what we think now. There were big boulders which were on top of these mountains and slid down to the bottom. That was one of them that they visited and this was an even bigger one. And this astronaut, Jack Smith, I'm going to talk about him in a moment, but he visited two of these boulders. This is a panoramic view of the landing sites, the North Mountain there, the South Mountain here, this eight kilometre valley in between. And this is a view of the volcanic crater, that dark crater is here. And in the side of it, we have the famous orange soil. Now, Professor Jack Smith came to London University a few years ago, 20, in May 2016. And I was uh, fortunate enough to go to his lecture and meet him afterwards. And we've already seen this slide a couple of slides ago of the lunar module over the landing site. That's, this is in Jack Smith's talk now. And another slide that he had was this slide. And this is the Apollo 17 landing site. This is the lander. In fact, I'll put the captions on. And the double tracks are made by the moon buggy, the lunar rover and the single tracks are made by the astronauts. And during this lecture, which I was um, fortunate enough to attend, Jack Smith, who made a footprint, said he had a job of setting up scientific equipment. This was on a boom, like a dumbbell shaped equipment with a boom to hold them. And he had to deploy them about a hundred meters away on some flat ground. So he left the lunar module and he staggered about over here and he completely missed this perfect area to do the equipment, set it all up, 100 metres away, and he kept on staggering about, going everywhere, and eventually put it all over here. 180 metres away, he got told off for using too much oxygen in his arm muscles, 
but this is the tracks of the astronaut staggering about, and the man who made those footprints was telling that story. It was quite incredible to be there. So I got to meet some athletes, couldn't resist this. Um, so that's um, Jack Smith, and that's a rather tall astronomer on the right. And then um, if you ask an astronaut, Pete Conrad was once asked, what do you need to be to be an astronaut? What qualifications do you need? And he was expecting the answer to be things like, oh, PhDs and lots and lots of experience and things. And Pete Conrad of Apollo 12 said, you need two things to be an astronaut. One, you need to be fearless. And two, you need to be short. Okay, just a bit of fit into those Apollo spacecraft. So I'm rather tall, Jack Smith is rather short. So there you go, it was an honor to meet him. And in my hand, I've got the NASA report of the geology of the Apollo 17 landing site, which he co-authored, and he hadn't seen it for many years. So he, he used the nicest look at that. So moving on, in this century, only a few years ago, the Chinese have been landing on the moon with robots and rovers. And this is the one that landed on the far side. The Chang'e 4 on the far side of the moon is there. That's the lander. And you can see the ramp that the rover drove down there. So this is a lander, that's the rover, small rover there. And um, there's another view of the far side of the moon with the rover being launched off the lander. So this is fairly similar to the first one they sent to the moon. And the Chinese have also done a sample return and returned 1.7 kilograms of rock back to earth, which hasn't been done since the 1970s. So I've just shown these moon rocks. Those are the two rocks I showed to the camera before. The light coloured anorphite on the left and the basalt, the dark coloured basalt on the right. The, so this is volcanic rock which has been erupted and this is there on earth but it forms the light highland regions of the moon. So let's have a little look at some moon rock and um, here's the um, some moon rocks on the Apollo missions. They're kind of kept in a perspex case you can see um, some lavas down here, dark lavas, some white highland stuff here, and this really is from the moon now, and various soils as well. And if I flip the slide around, you've got some soils from the highlands, soils from the lavas, and that strange orange soil which came from that volcano. You can also get moon rocks from the Apollo missions as microscope slides, and this is a picture I took when I was teaching at London University. Um, we get these slides once or twice a year, to look down the microscope and teach the students about the geology of the moon. But all the samples from the Apollo missions belong to NASA. You can't own them privately. If you want to own moon rocks privately, such as this one here, in, um, can you see the little white circle? <laughs> no, yes, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> that triangular dark, dark speck, I wish this was, but uh, no, it works and it stops. To do that, no, no, close to that. That little black speck in the in the circle is a moon rock, and it's a moon rock from the broken up jumbled moon rocks. And I've got another one here, and this one inside that little white circle, very small. This has got a great name. This is called the granulitic vecture, and that has been melted from the heat that blasted out a big crater on the moon. And that's where this has come from. So, and since all these meteorite, all, all the um, rocks in the moon come from NASA, to get them privately owned, you have to get them from meteorites. So things hit the moon, blast big holes in the moon, and bits of the moon fly off into space and some of them land on the Earth as meteorites. And I've got three of them here, and these are the three rocks. There's that triangle I tried to show you before. So this is broken up moon rock. This is the one that was formed from a melted crater, melted rock when a crater formed. And this is one from deep inside the moon's crust. I didn't show you that one, but that's, that's this one here. This one here has, was really deep and got flung out onto the surface by a big impact. So you can get meteorites, pieces of the moon, um, privately, but they've all fallen as meteorites. Precisely 10 years ago today, I was at the Observatory Science Centre at Hurstensea, 
using their biggest refractor and pointing it at the moon. So there's me, there's the moon, there's the biggest telescope, the biggest refractor at Hurston Sea. And this is what I was doing 10 years ago this evening. So I thought I'll put those slides in. That's quite a nice anniversary, isn't it? Uh, two results, I just had a handheld camera held to the eyepiece, but um, you know, the basic pictures of the moon, you can still see the seas, the highlands and the craters, and a little bit of um, blue from the um, fact that the telescope's not got the best lenses. So that's what I was doing 10 years ago. But when people dedicate themselves to doing proper pictures of the moon, they start to look at features like craters, flooded craters, little ridges, little domes, which are often volcanic, cracks in the ground as well. And there's quite a few features on this particular image which people look for an amateur or the strongest look for these. The craters, two good examples of modern crate of um, recent craters. This is Copernicus. Um, that's where it is. And this, this was a famous picture taken in the 1960s by one of the orbiting spacecraft. So it's very flat. 93 kilometers across, very small mountains in the middle, about a kilometer high. The rim's much higher and it's all collapsing, all these collapses and landslides around the rim. So that's a typical medium-sized crater on the moon. And another famous one is Tycho, here seen overhead by the Clementine spacecraft. This is 85 kilometers across. And I'm going to give you a little tour around the crater of the moon now. This is Tycho. This is um, actual image data on actual elevation data. And they're going to zoom in on the central peak. It's almost exactly one mile high or 1.6 kilometers high. And all those rocks in that mountain have come from deep within the moon, about one tenth to one fifth of the diameter of the crater straight down has been brought up to the surface. So the normal rocks of the surface are different from these rocks in the central peak. This has come from the lower crust. It's like when you drop a pebble in a pond of water, you get a splash, you get like droplets coming up again. And if, if it was cold water turning to ice, there'd come a point where it would start, start to stop flowing and solidify. And if you can get it just right, you can get that drop poking up in the center. And that's what's happened with this molten rock. It's very flat on the floor. And then as we move towards the edge of the crater, you've got these very steep regions, about three to four kilometers in total height, with lots of landslides coming off them. The bright areas are the youngest landslides. And this is a crater of all those rays at full moon as well. And if you look carefully, there's these dark lakes that are almost flat and no craters in. The, the tiny little craters and rubble dotted around but you get these dark areas, like ponds, ponds, and that is melted rock as a glass. It's a glass from impact melt. And one of the meteorites I showed you was from this sort of thing. There's no one there, these lakes. So it's ponded molten rock. Lots of other rock is blasted out, scattered around the moon to make the rays, and you see a full moon. Other rocks from this impact would have gone into space and some of them would have landed on the Earth as moon meteorites. I should say we also expect Earth rocks from the past to be on the moon that have been blasted off the Earth and some of them would have landed on the moon. So we do expect to find ancient Earth rocks on the moon in the future. So fascinating world. Um, those of you who observe the moon regularly will know that it doesn't quite stay fixed in the sky as it goes around the Earth. It has a slight wobble to it due to a couple of effects. So you have to count, over the course of a month, we can see 59% of the moon's surface over the course of a full month. So slightly more than half because the moon's in an elliptical inclined orbit. means we can see a little bit around the edges at different times of the month. So here's a... It's a take by an amateur astronomer of full moon, just about. Normal light, you can just about hint that there's different colours in the lavas. They're a bit darker here than here, a bit lighter and a bit yellowish really in the middle here. This is quite dark, this is quite light. But the lavas have got different colours. And the same observer um, that Verity did these, um, I stretched those colours in another image and you can see that some of the lavas appear slightly orange, 
and some of them, are, like this is a sea of tranquility where Neil Alson landed, appear quite blue-grey. And this tells us about the minerals in the lavas. The blue-grey, for example, has, has high amounts of titanium oxide in them. So we can actually work out the minerals that have been erupted at different times. And when we count the craters in these seas, the more heavily cratered regions are older and the regions with hardly any craters are younger. So we can actually work out that they've been erupted at different times in the moon's history. So I'm going to keep the, um, this picture that Ferris has taken here, but I've slightly reorientated it. And this is like a, a view from the Earth, trying to get some colour information. Now from a spacecraft, we can do that a lot better, more close up and with no atmosphere to, to stop us. And this is from the Galileo spacecraft. It was, it was going to Jupiter, it wasn't designed to look at our moon, but because it was flying past the Earth moon system twice on its way to Jupiter, it tested out its cameras on the moon. And when Galileo spacecraft flew past the Earth on its first flyby, it took this image. And you can see it's not quite the same as what our eyes will see. To our eyes, the moon looks quite white, greyish white, and the seas look light grey. But on this image from the Galileo spacecraft, the moon looks kind of browny white, much darker shade of white, and the seas look almost black. And that's actually because it's not a true colour image, it's actually got infrared information in it as well. So it distorts the colours to our eyes, where it enhances these minerals. We can actually work out what minerals in the moon a lot better by doing this. So when the Galileo spacecraft went past the moon a second time, it flew over the North Pole of the moon, which looks like that on Galileo. But if you take pictures through colour filters, you can recombine them and get a false colour image. And this tells the scientists exactly what minerals are in the moon at those points. So it's not quite the same as before. It's a, it's a false colour image rather than just a stretched image. But because we have astronauts who have brought rocks back to the Earth from known points on the Moon, we can take the spectra of those rocks and we know what the spectra is on those points of the Moon where the rocks were picked up. Which allows scientists to program, well, to design programs and to design camera filters to look for those spectral features. So we take an image like this, and then where the astronauts have landed, we know what that spectrum is. And then we can make sure that the whole image of the moon has got the correct data and look for things that we haven't seen before. So a picture like this can tell us any odd parts of the moon that we don't have rocks for, which will tell us where we want to land next time to get rocks we haven't already got. Does that make sense? So, We've got ground truth from certain locations to feed into this map. And then we can use this map to find other parts of the moon's surface where we'd like to land in the future. So that's quite a powerful technique of remote sensing. So a few spacecraft have been to the moon. I'll actually um, skip these, that slide. But the Clementine spacecraft on the top here was the first moon orbiter for about 20 years. And 1990s technology photographed the moon just like that near side and far side, and also in false colour. And this time, the cameras were designed for the moon minerals. Galileo was designed for Jupiter and Jupiter's moons. This one was designed for our moon. So we can really pick out the moon minerals and where they are on this map. It's very useful. And going back to the um, normal image, if I reproject this image, so that this is like on a globe, two globes, if I'm going to reproject this as an equal area projection, the other thing that the spacecraft did, Clement Simon, it orbited the moon, was it measured the height of the features on the moon. And another spacecraft called Lunar Perspector didn't have a camera, but it had radiation detectors. And it detected this bright colour. All this bright colour is lavas on the moon with a high radiation content, thorium, uranium, and uh, potassium-40. So there's radioactive materials in this part of the moon only, and a couple of dots elsewhere, and other lavas don't have them. So that's a mystery in itself. And when you count the craters on the moon, uh, I'll just, um, 
not the creator in the highlands, but the creators in the seas. The seas are not as heavily created as the highlands because they're younger. The white highlands have the much the most craters on them, but the lavas only have a few craters. But the ones with the most craters in those few are the oldest lavas that erupted first, and the ones with hardly any have erupted very recently. And when you count the craters in the lavas on the moon, you get a map like this. Where the purple and blues are really old, this is a sea of veins, that's a sea of um, serenity, that's a sea of tranquility. I don't know why they didn't do that sea. But when we look at the ocean of storms, we get really young lavas through the yellows and the reds. And the reds, they think there's so few craters, this might be only one billion years old. So these different lavas have got different ages. And it tells us where we need to land our spacecraft in future to say land at a junction that we can pick up rocks from the red area, and the yellow area, the blue area, the green area, and they should have all different ages. And then we bring those rocks to earth, find out how old they are in the lab, and then we'll have dates of when all these lavas erupted. So this map's gonna tell us where we want to land in the future. And all these young lavas, the ones that have been going and going the moon died early on, four billion years ago and three billion years ago. These lavas have been, I looked at them, I did. But these lavas are up to one billion years old. They're relatively young and they match where this radioactive region is. Okay, so that's a mystery in itself as well. So here's a satellite called Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's currently orbiting the moon. It's been there for over 10 years now. And this is the one that can see things down to 20 centimetres across, 21st centimetres across, I can see astronaut footprints. And that spacecraft has got really good, accurate imagery all over the moon and altimeter data. And if I project the moon again like that, this is the altimeter data from LRO. And the purple areas are the lowest parts of the moon and the red areas are the highest. And on the side facing the Earth, the highlands are greenish, so they're quite high. And the seas are blue, so they're all low. Big holes in the ground filled with lava, so they're low. When we go to the far side of the moon, there's hardly any seas, just a few, like the Sea of Moscow here, but it's really high. The highlands are much higher on the far side of the moon than on the near side of the moon, with the exception of this giant crater at the bottom here, the South Pole Aiken Basin, which is obvious. That's the deepest part of the moon, which is about here. And this is one of the biggest impacts in the solar system. So that shows up as a big purple blob. So that's it, heights of features on the moon measured from orbit from the spacecraft. You can get these on globes. I've got a globe here. It might not show because of the camera and things, but I'm hiding behind a moon globe. These are my globes. The one on the, the um, left is 15,000 images from LRO at high resolution. And the one on the right is that altimeter data. So I've got two 30 centimeter diameter globes, which I sometimes take to tops. Just a couple of final points. There's still surprises on the moon. And this, this image, which is about 10 years old now, is the near side of the moon. And the filters used on this spacecraft, it's an American camera on an Indian satellite. The seas look orange and the highlands look green. But what was unexpected here is that the blue areas indicate water in the sunlit parts of the moon. So that was a mystery. How can we get water on the moon if it's not even in the buried craters at the pole themselves? Turns out they're just little ions, and that's one, just an example of one of the puzzles that you can get from remote sensing. Sorry about that. The Apollo astronauts left moon quake detectors on the moon, and they're a bit primitive. And we got some data, but we weren't sure. But 40 years later, with modern software, modern computer packages designed for you know, seismic studies of the Earth, oil exploration and things like that, they revisited the Apollo data with modern software and got a really good picture of the inside of the moon. And we didn't know it had a core for sure before. We thought it might have, but we're not sure. But that data, the process, clearly shows the core, solid inner core, liquid outer core, mushy zone, and the sizes of those cores. So we actually probed the inside of the moon with old data and modern software and got that result. 
So the moon is a companion to the Earth. I did have a final section to do with the origin of the moon. I'm not sure how we're doing for time. Have I, have I got a three to four minutes left? We have ten minutes almost. Ten. Okay. Let's see. So I mentioned earlier about the three ideas about where the moon came from. Was it formed from somewhere else in the solar system and came past the Earth and got captured? Did it form with the Earth? Or did the Earth spin very quickly and throw a piece of itself out into space to make the moon? Remember those three theories? Well, that's all we could think of if you're stuck on the Earth looking at the moon through telescopes. But if you can go to the moon, get some rocks and bring them back to Earth, then you can do some geology and actually find some answers. Or find out none of those theories are correct and have to come up with new theories and then try and find out if they're the right answers which is exactly what happens in science. And that's what happened in this case. So the origin of the moon. So when the Apollo astronauts brought their rocks back, this white rock is very light minerals in it. And the lavas are quite dense, heavy minerals in them. So we had to explain this. Because the moon was basically globally made out of white rock that's very light. And then later on, lavas erupted out of the inside and filled in the big holes on the surface on the Earth side. So the new theory which came about, as you probably all come across, is this giant impact or the big whack, where something the size of Mars hit the early Earth, which wasn't quite as big as the present day Earth, about four and a half billion years ago. And this is a synopsis impression by Don Davis, a famous space artist. So it basically, the idea was is that Earth had already formed a rocky mantle and a metal core, and the Mars-sized planets which hit the Earth also had a rocky mantle and a metal core. And when they collided, they started to deform, of course, as the collision happened. And then the core of the impact had basically stayed within the Earth. And what was thrown out into space was rock from both Earth and the impactor. So most of this rock is rock and very little metal. And that was thought to form the moon, which has very little metal in it and a tiny core, not much of a big core. And this idea came about to explain that because this impact would have been hot, would have heated everything, and everything would have melted and some of it would have vaporized. So I'm just going to show this collision. That was the impact between the two objects. Very high temperatures in red. Any waters and gases would have been sent into space. So anything that the Earth had early on in terms of light elements, water would have gone. And only high melting and high boiling point elements would be left after this happens. So that's why he wanted a giant impact. And then the moon is forming this yellow thing and it's just rock with no water. This is what, how we thought we refined the moon after the Apollo missions. And sometimes it gets too close to the earth and, and uh, breaks apart again. That's called the Roche limit. So you have this collision, you have these long streamers and um, the moon forms, but it gets close to the earth and gets ripped apart again. And there's lots of impacts to the Earth and out into space. But you see it's like sort of windy spiral thing. It'll form a moon, get too close to the Earth and get broke up again by the Earth's tide. And that happens again and again. And eventually it'll form the moon outside where the tide will rip it apart. And it's been drifting apart ever since. There it is, the moon being ripped apart by the, by the Earth's tides in that simulation. That's a real simulation, by the way. So um, that's just a, the, so after that happened, the beam was a hot blob of rock. Hardly any metal, any rock, mostly from the impact on from Earth, glowing like that, and very bright in the sky, very close to the Earth, cooling down to space, forms a crust over it, and the inside is still molten, slowly cooling over time. So this impact was to do this. We had a magma ocean. The whole world was covered in a sea, an ocean of magma, molten rock, possibly all the way through, certainly a large part of the way through. It might have been solid in the middle. 
And when this happens, the heavy minerals sink to the bottom and the light minerals float to the top. And that's what happened as it cooled. So the dark minerals that make lava sank to the bottom and the light minerals that make anorthosite rock floated to the top. And as the ocean cooled, the top grew downwards, the heavy stuff grew upwards, and that sandwich layer in between, the orange layer, got thinner and thinner and thinner and collected all those radioactive elements. They stay in the layer in between the two. And then big impacts later on after the moon had solidified, exposed those elements on the part of the moon near the ocean of storms and kept those lavas going for much longer. But there are, I'll skip that slide, but there are problems with that. So there are other models as well. A current favorite of mine is instead of having a Mars planet hitting an Earth-sized planet, we have two half Earths hitting each other. And this is much better. So basically you have two planets about the same size and they completely mix together. So they all get iron, they all get rock and they form something that will look like the moon and the earth as well. So just to play that simulation, we've got two similar sized worlds and this model is better at explaining the facts than the old model. The old model was based on Apollo rocks, but since then we've been back to the moon with modern spacecraft, we've discovered there's water on the moon, we've discovered that there's light elements on the moon and we need a way of accounting for those. And there's other geological reasons as well. But we now think it was probably two similar sized planets that formed and then both Earth and Moon formed from the same cloud. This means the Earth and the Moon are the same, which they pretty much are, except the Moon hasn't got much water on it. So just to look to the future, we've done a lot from orbit with modern instruments. We can't make any more progress until we land on the surface. So there's a lot of effort now to land on the moon's surface. Europe's going to do so. China is doing so. Other countries are interested as well. And the Americans have announced they want to go to the moon, as does Europe. Probably, certainly within the last, in the next 10 years. I mean, 2024 was a date that was said before COVID. Might have delayed things a year or two. But there's a lot of interest in building a base on the moon, exploring the moon, going to all those places where we know there are strange rocks or young rocks so we can get a better idea of how the moon formed, how it evolved, what its relationship is to the Earth and how to use the moon to help us explore the rest of the solar system. So, and if you can't wait for people to go to the moon, there's a giant moon doing a tour at, at the moment. I've not actually seen it yet, but it, it appears in various venues this large moon and right there there's information we didn't know just 60 years ago one of the things down the road is how can we utilize this in technologies or industries or resources so it's a natural byproduct of scientific exploration to utilize what is found for our for commercial purposes so they kind of go hand in hand in my view really and um there's, there's enough known about the science to design commercial ventures on the moon already. And that's being done in a number of ways. I, I don't follow it very closely, but there's a whole cottage industry of working out how to utilize the moon. And that's been in existence for the best part of 20 years. So probably in the next 10 to 20 years, that will actually turn into some kind of action and, um, and realistic realistic sort of implementation of commercialization of parts of the moon and also scientific exploration. Um, the science done in the 60s and 70s was basically get there, come back. There was, it was political driven with, with, with just get to the moon a space race. It wasn't really designed in a proper scientific and optimum engineering way. But now we will be able to approach it in that way, in that new way. So I think that's both elements. It's certainly an active time for lunar research, including human beings there. In my view, it's much more sensible to learn how to live in Earth orbit and to live on the moon before going to Mars. The, if, if people want to go to Mars soon, 
it, it to me it sounds like in the 60s just to get there as a political goal and come back and that's incredibly dangerous and risky compared to the moon i think the we need more you know sort of more experience more knowledge more wisdom more capability with how to deal with space for people before we can safely and properly move on to mars so the moon's a natural learning ground basically training ground before going elsewhere in the solar system that's my personal view on that so. okay. uh, one more question from maria we have a question from mrs maria k okay proceed yeah. george Maria, hello. Okay, Maria wrote something in the chart. How are space agencies dealing with the cosmic rays as far as it concerns creating a base on the moon? Okay. Oh, the radiation hazards on the moon. There's, um, yeah, there's, there's a few things. Um, when, the, when the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, that they were exposed to high levels of radiation potentially, so that it was actually designed so that they would pass through the Earth's radiation zone as quickly as possible on, on trajectories that minimise their time in there. And the only real worry, and it's still a worry, is, um, is um, solar flares, basically, so solar activity. Things can happen on the sun, their solar maximum, which only gives hours notice before there's impacts on the earth a few hours notice. So solar minimum, so it's more of a chance of solar maximum, but you can't just keep space travel to solar minimum. So ways of protecting astronauts from radiation, one of the best ideas is to have a mini magnetic field around the spacecraft's crew quarters to deflect a lot of the charged particles around the spacecraft. On the moon surface itself, we now know there's lots of tunnels and caves made from lava that they were discovered by the orbiting satellites that take high resolution images. So good places for bases would either be inside those caves where the rock, after about a metre of depth of moon rock, the temperature stabilised, you don't get the extreme temperatures. So underground bases are likely to be the way to go. You can build a base on the surface and then cover them with water tanks and then covered those with moon rock and the water tanks are very good at absorbing radiation and the moon rock as well so you can actually build layered structures so there's, there's a whole but it's a whole learning process but the bases on the moon with local materials can be can be shielded the spacecraft on route to the moon that's a bit more tricky um, and I said a magnetic field and having a shelter inside the spacecraft, again with water walls and so on, water tanks around the walls, is probably the way to go. And you would certainly need that if you went to Mars. Because um, space is dangerous, you know, it's, um, we all want to go to space because you've watched Star Trek, but in reality it's, it's deadly, it's, there's vacuum and there's radiation and there's cosmic rays. <laughs> it's, um, it's easier said than done getting into space properly. The astronauts on the moon used to be report seeing flashes in their eyeballs with the charged particles going through their eyes or, or even through parts of their brain and just sparking off these flashes. And spacecraft on the surface of Mars get them as well in their cameras. So, yeah. Not sure what else I can say about that, but yeah, pe people are working on radiation. It's, um, it's, um, it's uh, one of the hazards of space travel. Everyone's had enough, that's all right. <laughs> okay, let me introduce a few more things which will happen in our online science cafe next. First of all, we should not miss this week, which already started the 9th of uh, February, when uh, our spaceships arrived to Mars. So they first arrived uh, the Emirates Mars mission, Hope Probe. It is today, a few hours ago, it's already made few orbits uh, since the moment when I took this uh, image. It is uh, uh, Emirate mission, it uh, arrived on the 9th of February and now it is on its orbit around Mars. So it started work, it's work soon. We'll get some results and that is the very first Emirates mission 
to any other planet at all. So we have to congratulate them with this uh, success. And uh, the next one was uh, Taiwan 1, most probably uh, Tianwen R. E. Uh, so it arrived the next day, the 10th of uh, February, and this is how it goes. Uh, so it arrived to Mars and they made uh, special uh, movements to uh, being set on the orbit around Mars. So now the uh, spaceship is already on its orbit and in May it will uh, uh, there will be landing of uh, rover on Mars. So that's what's going on with China exploration and they make great success, really uh, impressive. And the next one, it will be in two, just in two days. So I am sure that this will be all over the world with uh, online uh, uh, recordings and uh, uh, how it's not recordings on uh, uh, streaming online streaming it is uh, nasa uh, program mars 2020 so it will be landing on mars so there will be two interesting things not just uh, a, a rover on mars but a helicopter the very first helicopter in history and uh, that uh, humans will send so that's what's going on just these days and what happened and what will be in future. So I think we, uh, we will follow what's going on with exploration on Mars, of Mars. And just in two weeks, we'll have one more talk about uh, new achievement of Cyprus, uh, participation of uh, uh, International Olympiad. Uh, there will be the, for the first time because of pandemic. There was global electronic competition on astronomy and astrophysics, and uh, it was participated uh, by Stelios Sikalides, and uh, he will give talk <laughs> how he participated, and what was there, and he is connected with our planetarium, Kitten Planetarium and Observatory. So let's have a look. What, go, what he will present to us in two weeks. Uh, Alexander, before we close, I want to share my screen again. Welcome. Okay. Uh, any, any more question? Okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Yes, now you are sharing. William, this is for you. Happy birthday, dear William. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Happy birthday, William. Brilliant. Oh, you yeah. have a birthday now, can't I? That's you? great work, William. Thank you very much indeed. I thoroughly enjoyed that. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> hope, hope, um, hope it was informative and everyone enjoyed it, and um, I certainly did. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, yeah, Thanks, sweet. William. It was great. I've got a couple of hours working on my birthday now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So, see you in two weeks' time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.